should know that by now because we've been talking about it every single time. The word holy is the most important. But you see, for the world, the word holiness, it's probably to the world's mind, and, and many people do not understand God, the least attractive attributes of God. Something that is not appealing. And of course, everybody would agree that love is the most attractive. You see, it's, it's just like that. But God emphasized that He is holy. That's what He says. Do you know that the Bible talks more about the holiness of God than the love of God? God is love. This is clear. God is love. We read it. There are scriptures that says it. And the love of God. Uh, but loving does not exclude or eliminate another one. God is both. God is holy. And holiness is positive. We have seen it before. Holiness is pure. Holiness is exempt of evil, of wickedness. Holiness is, is separated from corruption. Holiness is what we should all be aiming for. It's, it's the greatest quality to seek for. Love is the, the, the attributes of God that, that is reaching out to us. But the goal is holiness. Do you, do you understand what, what I'm talking? Love, love is the attributes that God used and relationship to get you to know Him and, and come to Him through holiness. But the goal is to perfection. It's to prepare you for heaven. So God is love. He wants to bring you to heaven. But without holiness, you cannot see the Lord. You cannot enter into heaven. So... God loves you and he wants to make you holy. So it's, these are not to be dis, dis, disconnected. When Jesus teach his disciples to pray, what did he say in the first declaration of the Lord's Prayer? Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed is agios, holy. May your name be kept holy. Is the holiness of God. The first thing that Jesus teaches us when you approach God in prayer is, Father, you are in heaven, you are holy, your name is holy. That's, that's how God. So it's not a concept of the Old Testament. Jesus is teaching us when you approach God in prayer as children of God, call Him holy. That's, that's what He is. So it's not a negative uh, thing. Holy. Let's go to... Uh, Okay, let's stop here. Before we go on, we will uh, switch off that light here. I want to show you a short video. This is an overview of the book of Leviticus. You will see it will make a lot of sense when you will see the big picture uh, going through the book with this. Uh, it will look a little bit like a cartoonish. But it's not cartoons. The people who have done it, they just build illustration. They are doctors in theology. They are professional. They know the Bible. So it's not like a children's things. It's really a, a good explanation, a good summary of the concepts found in the book of Leviticus. <clears throat> the book of Leviticus, we know you've... is used in Leviticus to describe God's pure and powerful presence, which, like the sun, is both good and dangerous. So the point of Leviticus is to show how corrupt Israelites can live near God's goodness without being destroyed. Now, in the book, there are three ways for how this is all going to work out, and these are going to seem strange to you, but just hang in there with us. The first one is rituals, the second is this idea of the priesthood, and the third is a bunch of purity laws. Now, the book is broken up into seven sections, and each solution is explored in two sections of the book. The rituals are here, the priests are here, and the purity laws go here. Now, the first solution, rituals, involves a lot of animal sacrifices. And so Leviticus begins with detailed instructions for how to make these sacrifices. Some are ways of saying thank you to God, and others are simply ways of saying I'm sorry. And here, at the end of the book, there are some more rituals. These are about observing sacred days and festivals. They're all celebrations that retell some part of the story of how God rescued Israel and set them apart from the nations. The second solution to the holiness problem has to do with priests. 
you see, being directly in God's presence is really dangerous. So he appoints priests as special representatives who can go into his presence on behalf of others. So in this section, we have a story about how the priests are ordained into the priesthood. And then this other section explains the set of higher standards that the priests have to live by because they work so closely to God's presence. The third solution in the book is all about purity laws. And this is by far the hardest thing to understand. For example, in this section, we're really concerned with knowing whether you're clean or unclean. Or another way of saying that is being pure and impure. And here's what we need to know to understand this. When you're in a pure state, you can be near God's presence. When you're in an impure state, you can't. And so it was really important for Israelites to know what state they're in at any given moment. So the first thing we have is a list of pure and impure animals. Yeah, this list of animals is divided up by where they live. So on the land, in the sea, in the air. And the text is just not clear about why certain animals are impure or why touching or eating them makes you impure. What is clear, however, is that avoiding these creatures will set Israel apart and it will remind them that God's own holiness should affect every part of their lives, including what they eat. After the food laws, we get a lot of random rules uh, about things like skin disease, touching dead bodies, what to do with bodily fluids. But they're not random. All of these are things that the Israelites associated with life and death, which are sacred things because God is the author of life. Okay. But simply coming into contact with these things makes you impure? They do, but we have to keep in mind that it's not wrong or sinful to be ritually impure. You just wait a few days, take a bath, offer sacrifice, and you're pure again. What is inappropriate is entering into God's presence when you're in an impure state. Now, there's more purity laws over here in this section. Yeah, these focus on Israel's moral behavior. So these are laws about social justice, healthy relationships, having sexual integrity. Living by these laws will make Israel into a morally pure people who can live near God's presence. Those are the three solutions. Now, you've probably noticed that they surround the very center of this book. And it's here that we find a really important ritual called the Day of Atonement. Yeah, so Israel's a big tribe now, and odds are there's a lot of sin happening that goes unnoticed that people are not dealing with. And so one time a year, the priests would take two goats, and one of those goats is killed, and its blood is carried right into God's presence where it symbolically covers or atones for Israel's sin. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Well, the meaning of the sacrifice, it's explained in the next chapter, where God says that the blood of a creature is its life. And so this goat's life is offered as a substitute. It's receiving God's punishment for Israel's sin so that the people don't have to. That leaves the second goat. Yeah, the priest puts his hands on it, and then he confesses all the sins of Israel. It's like he's placing the sins on the goat. And then that goat gets cast out forever into the wilderness. It's called the scapegoat. Yeah, I've heard that word before. Yeah, it's this very powerful image of how God is graciously removing Israel's sin. But let's be honest, sacrifices in general seem so barbaric. We have to remember that in the ancient world, sacrifices were the main way of buying favor from the gods. But the problem was that those same gods, they're unpredictable, they're fickle, you never know if they're going to ignore you or they're going to turn on you. And so it's in this cultural setting that we see Israel's God as totally different. He does get angry about human corruption, but it is never arbitrary. And he loves people. So he provides this clear way for Israel to know with confidence that they are forgiven and that despite their corruption, they are safe to live near his presence. And so that makes the book of Leviticus actually a revolutionary statement in its day. So that's Leviticus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So that is a simple way, but that is a very good way, isn't it? To, to, to get the, the, main, the main concept. So let's continue to what we have been uh, starting with. I don't know how far we will be uh, going. So Leviticus chapter 29, verse 1 and 2. <coughs> The Lord also said to Moses, give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You must be holy. Set apart. Be different. So that's why I called the title of this sermon, 
be different. You are called to be different because you are called to associate with God. God is holy. You are called to be w like Him, uh, be different. That, that's what we, we talk, consecrated for a specific use. You see, we have these wonderful baskets here. Okay, this is a basket. It can be used for many different things. In that sense, it is not holy because it is not consecrated to one thing. But if I say this basket from now on, is going to always be here and only, only, only ever to not to do any other things but to be maybe carrying the flowers for the church in the presence of God because it's so magnificent or whatever, just an illustration. Then we, we could say in a way that it is set apart and that's not going to be used for trash, not going to be used for t-shirts, not going to be used for anything else, it's going to be here only for one use. So that is uh, holiness. So for yourself, if you are going to be consecrated to the Lord, you have to do something. In Romans chapter 6, I don't have it there, but I will t tell you a, a definition of holiness. Do not present your body as instruments of unrighteousness, but offer yourself completely to God. Use your old body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Two things. To be holy, consecrated to God, you must turn from something. Turn away from something. It's like repentance and then away. You turn away from sin, anything that defiles corruption and purity, and you turn to God. This is called Kadesh in the Old Testament, Hagios in the New Testament. You, you, you don't anymore use your body as an instrument to do what is ungodly. It's, it's not this use for my body, my life. I'm offering my body, I'm offering my life to God. God used my body as, for, as an instrument that will bring glory uh, to you. So if we do a, a, a quick, quick summary of what we have learned so far, chapter 1 to chapter 10 of Leviticus, we have learned about how sinful people are, we can approach a holy God, and also the regulations for errands and his sons, the priests. Us and the priests, and you remember the five sacrifices and all this. So now we're going to move to part two. Walk with God through sanctification. Israel and us, we are called to be different. So it's now that we have been learning about approaching God through sacrifices, and we have explained sacrifices. We have looked at these sacrifices and the priesthood are symbols prefiguring types announcing the sacrifices of Jesus, what Jesus Christ was to, to accomplish through once and for all sacrifice. We have looked at that, so, so th this, is, this is clear. Now that we have dealt with this part of the book, we are now talking about how are we going to live? It's like you have become now a Christian. So are you, how are you going to live your Christian life? So that's basically what we are talking about. And again, we will find many concepts that are to the Israelites of this time, but principles that also apply to us who live in the New Testament as well. Walk with God through sanctification. Stay clean as you walk with the Holy God. Avoid being defiled. We can give an illustration of that. We come to church on Sunday morning. We can be emotional. We can cry. We can lift our hands, we can dance before the Lord, but the real test is when you will leave the church. The real test of our walk with God, our, our walking through sanctification is from Monday to the next Sunday. This is how we are. So how are you like, what are you like when you leave the fourth floor uh, or the second floor and then you go on the fourth floor after the service, or when you go on the street, at the restaurants, or tomorrow morning, or the rest of the week, do you reflect that you have been in the presence of God? We've been in the presence of God on Sunday. Does that being reflected on Monday to Saturday? Chapter 11 and 15, we have a variety of regulations about ritual purity. And if we want to go quickly, it deals with the, the below here deals with the de clean diet, and we will touch over that. Purification 
after you give birth. Skin disease, clothes infected with mildew or infectious disease, how to examine and how to treat and purify. Leprosy, infectious skin disease and bodily discharge. Let's go to uh, Leviticus chapter 11 and we will look for two basic reasons why God is giving us some uh, diet restrictions. Why some animals are pure, some animals uh, are not pure. And we will not look at the details of everything, but we will look at the why, because that's really important. So try to understand why God is doing these things. Verse 45, I am the Lord. Okay, that starts very clear. That's already one of the reasons. For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. It's like, uh, if, then. Because I am, so therefore you will be. Okay, this is the law about the bees, bird, every living creature that moves through the waters, every creature that swarms on the ground, to make distinctions or to distinguish between the unclean, the clean, the between the living creatures that may be eaten and the living creatures that may not be eaten. And there's a distinction. God starts in the book of Leviticus like that. Reason number one, that visibly, Israel can be distinguished from other nations because I am the Lord your God you will be holy so that's to separate this is a sorts of rules to separate you this nation are different from the other nations and we will see a little bit more later and why um, reason number two to ensure the health care of the nation for sanitary reason, pure and simple. Imagine, now we have hospital clinics, you, you, you know, you can go to internet, you can go to any medical shops and buy any medicine for anything. Infection of the feet, infections of the skin, you can beautify yourself, you can buy cosmetics, you can buy anything, because everything is so accessible. Now go back 3,000 years ago. Was it like that? Would the Israel who live here would they go to the 7-Eleven or to the drugstore on the street corner? Whoa, where is the street corner over here? Or just down below the, the Mount Sinai, turn three, three valleys further under the rock and then you will find it there? Like Fred Flintstones living there or something? So 3,000 years ago, there was not any food and hygiene department telling us what you need. You, you, like now, if you have a problem with your stomach, the hospital, the doctors will assign to you uh, dietitians. And then they will tell you what you can eat, what you should be eating for breakfast, how many calories, whatever is good or not for you. 3,000 years ago, there was no food and hygiene department, or FDA department. There was only G-O-D and H-O-L-I-Y. So there was only this department. They didn't know what was good to eat at the time. They were traveling from Egypt to another land. Have you ever uh, compared the food from different countries? When you go to different countries, it's very interesting what you, what you are presented to eat in some countries. Like I remember one of my friends, a missionary in Africa, was offered um, um, monkey, monkey brain, <laughs> monkey brain soup. And he always carried secretly some uh, seeds, uh, peanuts and things like that to, to feed himself. If you go to the Philippines, you will be offered balut. For, for Filipinos, what's wrong with balut? It's really good for your health, it's good for your blood pressure, which is true actually. But for a foreigner who never ate balut, so who was that? I have, someday I'm going to pull out some of the photos that I have taken in Tagaytay. Some funny photos. Yes, I uh, will surprise you. There are still people angry with me from the Tagaytay experience <laughs> when I introduced them to, to Balut. Anyway, there's no, nothing wrong with Balut. It's good. It's good for you. Amen. Amen for Balut. Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> But in that time, they didn't know what was good to eat, which season, what food was poisonous. But God knew, and to protect them from disease. And then, because God is interested in every details of our lives. Imagine, that's the foundation of a new nation that is called to be holy before God. Look at the next slide. I want to give you some quotes here. 
Look at S.F. Kellogg is a very important theologian and also missionary, very intelligent, that has worked in India and America as a Presbyterian missionary. And this is what he says about his discovery in the book of Leviticus. One of the greatest discovery of modern science is the fact that a large number of diseases are due to the presence of low forms of parasitic life to which certain animals are liable. Recent investigations show that prohibitions and permissions of the Mosaic law concerning food become justifiable, reasonable. It makes sense. That's what basically he's saying. Go to the next one, Noel Debussy in 1885. <coughs> he spoke to the Paris Academy of Medicine. The idea of parasitic infectious disease greatly occupied the mind of Moses and dominated his hygienic rules. He excluded from the Hebrews diet animals, particularly liable to parasites. And as it is in the blood that germs and spores of infectious disease circulate, he ordered that they must be drained of the blood before serving for food. This is so wise. This is so reasonable. This is the, the best way to stay. And you know, long ago, when the, the, the plague was destroying Europe, the continent of Europe, the Jews universally escaped this infection. And even many leaders of countries were suspiciously accusing the Jews, they must be the one that have caused this plague by poisoning. But you know, the, the Jews, they kept their, their, their diet so pure by, by traditions that they were kept from continents being erased under the different plagues that came from something like that. So we can trust God and His wisdom. Amen? Amen. Chapter 12, Childbirth. Leviticus 12 to I'm just gleaning here and there through these, these chapters, some points that I have thought was, was interesting. If a woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son, she will be ceremonially unclean. When the time of purification is completed for either a son or a daughter, the woman must bring, uh, a, it is like a, a, a lamb, for a burnt offering and a, and a purification offering like turtle doves or pigeon. If she cannot afford to bring a lamb, she, if she is too poor, God is concerned for the poor, by the way. If she cannot afford to bring a lamb, she must bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. One, of w one will be for the burnt offering, for sin, the other for the purification offering, the birth of the child. The priest will sacrifice them to purify her, and she will be ceremonially uh, clean. As soon as the child was born, mom had to bring a burnt offering and a sin offering. Isn't it interesting that it is like this? And it is, uh, again, a reminder, cleansing is necessary because we are sinner by birth. That's, that's very simple. You know, this is not to diminish women, not at all. This is a reminder, there's a new human being being born he is born out of sin, a sinful nature is born. So you bring your sinful nature, little child, and you purify this child. Mom, purify herself, because this is how we approach God, to be ceremonially clean. You remember in the video, it talks that to be ceremonially clean is not really a problem, because you can fix that. God says, you bring your burnt offering, you restore yourself, you are purified again, and then you approach God. It is just a way to come uh, near to God. God values women as much as men, as men in terms of approaching God. If you go to the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says to men to treat their wife with knowledge, to live with them with knowledge, with respect, treat them with honor as a weaker vessel, knowing that she inherit of the same grace of salvation as you do and make sure that you treat her properly so that it is not going to hinder your, uh, your, your relationship with God. If you don't treat your wife properly, it, it makes you, in a way, if you use uh, Leviticus terms, it makes you ceremonially 
unclean. You cannot come near to God. There is a hindrance between you and God. So your life must be. So the wife in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, inherit the same grace of eternal life as men. There is no distinction. So here we find already the foundation of that teaching about value of men. God created men and women. That's how he created. You find it from Genesis. But here it's very clear that God is revaluing women as much in terms of approaching God. But try to visualize the scene at the temple. I have been in Xinjiang province among the Muslim in China, in the western part of China near, near Kazakh, uh, Kazakhstan and uh, Kashgar near Pakistan over there. This is all Muslim. We went to a, a small town. This is market day. And I, I went to the market day and I was looking for a picture to show you but I couldn't find my picture. So, but it's very significant what I'm saying because it's a similar sets of culture at the time. You go to the market where they, they, they bring their, their sheep, the, the many, many sheep and cows and everything. What do you see there? You see many women? You don't see any women there. This is a man's thing. This, in this culture, this is man's. Go to the market. Men go to the temple. Men go out. Women stay home. That's how it was at that time over there. So think, think in terms like that. Who takes care of, of raising the sheep? Men. Who bring the, the sheep to the market to be sold? Men. So, so that, is, that was like this. Now here we have a mention of the right and privilege of women to come to God and being purified at the same level as men can. So that is something significant. It's not to put down. Sometimes I used to read the text like that. Oh, women are put down. They are ceremonially unclean because they gave birth. That's not the point. The point is the opposite. They are uh, given the privilege to come to be purified so that at the same level of men, they can also be accepted by God and live, live their life with the Lord and the same, the same things. Also realize that in the same uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, things that I've just described, when the woman with this newborn baby will go to the temple, she will have the baby in her arm. Can she bring the sheep, pull the sheep, have the babies and all of this and the, water, the milk and the blankets and everything? They didn't have a car to go there. So that means this was a family trip. The husband was participating along with his wife to the purification of the, the wife and the child. It was like a, a, a nice experience, a family experience, a, a trip a trip, a nice family trip to the temple together. A little bit like when you see um, Hannah and Elkanah going to the temple every year for the fellowship uh, barbecue and you know having time with their friends and celebrating and sharing food. This is a, a joyful experience. They just gave birth to a child. They are going to say thank you to the Lord. She is going to be purified and her husband is going to be part of that. This is a wonderful picture. Uh, to me, it strengthens the family value because I don't think the woman would go there alone because that's not the culture where women do things alone. The husband must be there also with her. But God says, let the woman come to me. I will purify her on the same level as I can purify men. Amen? That, that's why I choose this, this, this text. Chapter 13 to 15, I don't have it there, but it's about skin disease, clothes, and with infectious uh, mold or mildew, leprosy, running sores, bodily discharge. Let's go to chapter 16, the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, we've talked about it. You have seen a very good explanation in the short video that, that we, we have. It's also called Yom Kippur special day in the calendar where the sin of the nation was dealt with. It is called the Isaiah 53 of the Torah. The Torah is the five books of Moses, the law, and it is called the Isaiah 53. This is one chapter or two chapters that you need to read. When you read Leviticus, don't skip this one. This is the center of the book. This is really, really important. Yom Kippur, 
was not a joyful celebration, but a day of introspection, confession of, of sin. This is the day out of the year, once in a year, where the high priest purify himself through very complex cleansing, water, bathing, changing clothes, and all of this, to be ceremonially uh, acceptable to meet with God. He will offer sacrifice for himself first, then bathe again, change his clothes. And this is a very uh, complex ritual. He needed to be ready himself before he would do it for the people. The high priest enters into the Holy of Holies, the, the holy place of the, the, the tent, this very big place where the, and the gold angels and the mercy seats was. Only once a year he can enter there with fear and trembling and with sprinkling of bloods and incense and all of this on behalf of the entire nations. But here we have to introduce the concept of the scapegoat. And I think you've seen it in the video so it's easier for us to understand. On that day after he purified himself, then he, they would have two goats uh, approaching to the, for the, the next uh, series of sacrifice. One was the sin offering. So I'm not de uh, describing this one because we have talked so much about the five sacrifices at the beginning of that series. I don't want, I just want to highlight more the second one, the live goat, Azazel, or the, scape, the scapegoat. And then you, that's why this, this text here is, is describing that. He will lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellions, and sins of the people in Israel. And this way, he will transfer the people's sin to the head of the goat. I want you to, to pay attention to that. And this way, he will what? Transfer the people's sin to the head of the gold. Remember this illustration and uh, evangelism explosion? If this is a book with all the sins of my life, and it says in Isaiah 53, and that it pleased the Lord God to lay upon him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So now this is me. Before it was me and my sin. Jesus the Lamb of God, the sacrifice. He laid upon him the sin of us all. He transferred upon him the sin of us all. So now I am free of sin. So that is exactly what we see here. So that is a very important text. He will transfer the people's sin to the head of the goat. Then a man specially chosen for the task will drive the goat into the wilderness. As the goat goes into the wilderness, it Again, pay attention, it will carry all the people's sin upon itself and to a desolate land. This goat is going to be eaten by wild animals. It's going to die. It's never coming back. It's never coming back. Your sin is not coming back. Your guilt is not coming back for what has been transferred and sent into the wilderness. Your shame Whatever you have done in the past, even be, be careful because you and I, we have, God created us uh, extraordinary creature. We have so many functions of all sorts. And one of the wonderful functions that allows us to recognize each other is called memory. Imagine if we wouldn't have memory every Sunday well, actually, we could not even come on, on Sunday to church. We would not remember where it is. We would have to go to Google every Sunday to search for the church. But we could not even remember each other. Is that, what's your name, Sandy? Is that Sandy your name? Did I ever met you before? Anyway, th that's not the point. But memory is a wonderful uh, faculty. But memory, if you have experience and your past, um, traumatism, abuse, uh, sexual, whatever, or you have done horrible things in your past, okay, now you are saved, praise God. But that, don't, don't you, have, have, haven't you experienced that this memory, sometimes, it brings back the bad of the past. But that is memory of the past is not guilt. It's not the same as uh, 
uh, as your, your guilt is back. The guilt is not back. Before God, it's been taken, it's been removed, it's been transferred, it's been sent in the wilderness. So be careful. When the memory of this, this horrible sin come back to you, don't fall under the devil's prey. Just say, I am clean. I have been washed of that. Jesus forgave me. This is only a memory. Make, make a distinction between the fact of sin and the memory of sin. Do, do you understand what I'm talking? So that, that's important because many, many people, it's like you feel bad when you have a memory like me. I know that I have things I have done in the past. I'm really ashamed of these things. And sometimes, poof, for no reason at any time just pops up. And I need to, uh, I don't want that. I don't want that. Okay, so, so it will carry all the people's sin upon itself into a desolate land. I want to give you a, a parallel text from the Psalms to express that doctrine, Psalm 103. Because it also describes the character of God. And I think when you study the book of Leviticus, you discover the character of God. But sometimes we need external help to see the character of God. God made known his ways to Moses. That's what we read in Leviticus. He reveals, God speaks every time he speaks to Moses, Moses, give this instruction to my people. So God made known his ways to Moses. He is acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always keep being angry. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Imagine if you would remove all these sacrifices and forgiveness and the way to approach God. If God has not prepared a way for forgiveness, we would be condemned. We could not approach the holiness of God. So as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. That's what we are reading in Leviticus chapter 16. The scapegoat. It takes all of our sins into the wilderness. As far as the east is from the west. And this is an impossibility in physics. Uh, impossibility. The east never meets the west because whatever position you are going east, the east is always further. Go east, go east, and then you will turn around the earth many, many times. And realize that this is the chapter right at the center of Leviticus, and it is the most, the utmost prefiguration of Christ in the Bible, according to, uh, similar to uh, Isaiah chapter 53 and some of the, Psalm 22. The two goats represents two ways God was dealing with Israel's sin. He was forgiving their sin through the first goat, which was sacrificed, holy burnt. And the second goat, he was removing their guilt through the second goat, the scapegoat that was sent into the wilderness. And Leviticus, the same ritual is repeated every year. Through Jesus Christ, he replaced that system. And once and for all, our sins have been forgiven and our guilt has been removed when you place your trust in Jesus Christ. This you must be sure of. Are you sure? Yes? A little... <laughs> and other things realize also about this. Aaron... If you read this text, you will see Aaron spent hours and hours and hours uh, uh, preparing himself to meet God. You and I, we can approach God just like that. Immediate access. No need to change your clothes. No need to go and bathe in certain kind of products and uh, offer so many types of sacrifice. So what a privilege we have. We have access to God in an easier way than the Old Testament priest. But don't take this privilege for, for granted. Every time when you approach God, know that you are approaching the Holy God and realize that, you know. Think about, think about baptism. 
Think about uh, communion. This is what we are talking about when we think about it. The privilege of coming back uh, to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 17 is a center of the book as well. The mega theme, the blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without Hebrew 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no uh, forgiveness of sin. So blood is the basis of the relationship with God. I, I want to skip to chapter 18 to 20. Chapter 18 to 20, we call it the laws of holiness. This is, like, uh, this is the title that theologians have given to that. It starts very formal and the section finishes very formal in the same way. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Look how it starts. I am the Lord your God. So do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live, the people of Canaan where I'm taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all my regulations and be careful to obey my decrees for I am, I am the Lord your God. If you obey my decrees, my regulations, you will find life through them. I am the Lord. These chapters begin and close with the expression, I am the Lord your God. More than 50 times, realize that, what I'm saying. More than 50 times in this book, I am the Lord your God. Or I am the Lord that sanctifies you. Or, be, you know, I am the, the Lord, the Holy God. You need to be holy. I am the Lord your God. So what's happening here? God asserts his authority, his supremacy. I am God. I am God, number one. This authority is right. He's the owner. Okay, I used to tell my children when they were... Uh, uh, kind of rebelling with me or asking for more privilege. Uh, I'm paying, I decide. When you pay, you decide. Okay? So anyway, that's a simple rule that I used to, uh, to apply at, uh, at home. So, because um, sometimes you see, the children will say, why should I blah, 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 blah? Because I said so. Okay, but blah, 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 see, because I'm, I'm, because I'm the boss, like, okay. So God is doing the same thing uh, with us today. For I am the Lord your God, okay? If you don't like God's rules, here is a suggestion for you, okay? Go and create your own universe. Create your own <laughs> solar system. Create your own planet. Okay, that has the right combinations of oxygen, nitrogens, and the right um, laws of gravities, where you can, the right proportion of water and ground, create it all by yourself, then you can make your own rules. Because for now, you are living on the real estate of God. Yes? All right, number one. Number two, he reminds everybody that he has an, a, a covenant with the Lord. I am the, the Lord, your, your. This is the your, that your God. That, that, that's, that's connection between you and me. We're special together. We are in a covenant with God. How many of you have been baptized here? Hello, show me your hands. <laughs> yes? Okay. This is the day. And, and th this is something I really, it's really got, uh, got clear to me. When you are baptized, this is the day when you really publicly agree that your life will be different. You d died for sin, your whole life is dead. You're raised from God, you are going to live a new life. You are doing exactly what Leviticus is saying here. You are in an agreement and you are saying, Jesus, you and I, we're buddies. We are together. I'm never going to walk away from you. Everything you're going to ask of me, I'm, I'm, I'm saying yes already. I trust you, so I'm going to obey and be baptized. This is a declaration I, that I am, you and I, we are in a covenant together. Okay? So that's what we have been doing. How many of you take communion every month? What are we doing? 
we are celebrating this covenant the Lord your God the all the sacrifices the priesthood everything that he has done the scapegoat the sacrifice for sin the removal of guilt we are reminding ourselves of this this is the covenant so the Lord 50 times and these short books because Leviticus is not like uh, enormous books compared to some of the prophets only 20 some chapters 50 times is repeating because I am the Lord your God so this is what I'm asking do not imitate do not live like you used to do not live like they do because you belong to me now we are in a covenant because I am the Lord your God because I am the Lord your God do not live like that be different so are you different this morning?